Yanis, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. One, one, one. Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Uh, so thank you, Besnik, for the great introduction. Uh, my name is Yanis Zergsdens, as already was presented. I am uh, representing Riga Technical University, and uh, today I will be your moderator for the first panel, which is called Analysis. And uh, happy to be here, happy to be uh, in Florence, and uh, hello to everyone watching us uh, from your home countries. To start off, I want to uh, introduce uh, the way how we'll be, we'll be uh, working. So today in panel analysis, we have three presentations. Uh, first of all, let's uh, listen to the two presentations presented by uh, Anda Ruskule from uh, Baltic Environmental Forum uh, Latvia and um, also by Markus Korkhonen from Lapland University of Applied Sciences. Then we will have a small discussion and uh, it will be followed uh, by the presentation of uh, Einhoa Gonzalez from the University College Dublin in Ireland. So uh, as Besnik already mentioned, uh, feel free to ask the questions to the chat. I will be reading them and asking uh, them those questions to uh, presenters. Okay, so first of all, I would like to uh, ask Ander Uskule from Baltic Environmental uh, Forums to come here, sit with me and uh, present the Life Viva Grass integrated uh, planning tool of grassland uh, management. So. Oh, and before that, I'm sorry, uh, before this panel, uh, there will be a short video, uh, one of the videos about uh, one of the good practices. So, yeah. Policymakers, forest managers, forest engineers and owners would like to make better decisions about forest management. When creating forestry plans, they would like to consider both the economic and ecological aspects of ecosystem services. In order to do so, they need more information about tree species, their condition and several other factors affecting the forest habitat. Time-consuming fieldwork used to be the only source of reliable information. Such fieldwork requires considerable resources, including labour and time. By using remote sensing, we can learn more about forests quickly. It is also more cost-effective, but forest managers have to learn new ways of obtaining and interpreting the new data. The Red Faith project is a good example of how to obtain crucial information using airborne technologies. Red Faith uses cutting-edge technologies based on drones and high-resolution aerial and satellite images to gather, evaluate and translate data, which can be easily interpreted by forest experts and decision-makers. This information can be used for smarter management, restoration and conservation of forests. The Interreg Europe Progress Project is identifying and disseminating this and other good practices across Europe to further include ecosystem services in policy and decision making. Visit www.redfaith.hu and download free studies to learn more about this good practice. And visit the Interreg Europe Progress website to learn more about our project activities. Thank you very much for the video. And now I will give the floor to Andrew Skule from Baltic Environmental Forum. And she will be presenting the Life Viva Grass Integrated Planet Tool for the Grassland Management. Anda, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, hello to everybody. Really nice to see finally people in, in face and, uh, and be here in Florence. And, so I'm happy to introduce our Vivagrass uh, um, integrated planning tool, which was developed a few years ago. 
in a project called Life Vivagrass. So, um, how it works? Okay, so first, shortly, a few words about Life Vivagrass. Um, so, this is the full title is Integrated Planning Tool to Ensure Viable Grass viability of grasslands and it was a project funded by EU life program uh, life plus environment and um, it was lasting for almost five years and ended in april 2019 and uh, so project area covered three baltic uh, uh, countries latvia estonia and lithuania and uh, it included nine case study areas uh, and uh, so also for yeah for demonstration and testing our approaches and and the tool uh, project was coordinated by Baltic Environmental Forum Lithuania our partner organization but also BEF Latvia and BEF Estonia was involved in coordination and we had the scientific support from University of Latvia Estonia and University of Life Sciences um, joint stock company Knit Baltic for this um, programming solutions and Institute of Environmental Solutions from Latvia. And then we had uh, several partners representing case study areas, which was municipal from municipality level, from so regional level. And uh, so they, they were involved directly in, in testing our approaches and stakeholder engagement. So I'm going to next slide, yeah. Now, the objective of the project was to support maintenance of biodiversity and ecosystem service uh, this provided by grasslands uh, through encouraging ecosystem-based approach in, in the planning and viable grassland management. So, and the major task of the project was exactly the development of this tool, which was uh, aiming to operationalize the concept of ecosystem services into planning and yeah, grassland management. And um, so what is this tool? It is a spatially explicit decision support tool uh, for land use planning and sustainable uh, management of agroecosystems. And it has uh, several functions. And so it includes uh, mapping and assessing of agroecosystems from actually from local to national level. And it also provides uh, recommendations on the grassland management to support supply of ecosystem services. And also for the planning purpose, it offers a multiple multi-criteria decision support for yeah, looking for how, how, how best to plan an area for also for ec supporting ecosystem service supply. And um, yeah, so the um tool includes three models uh so from application perspective so it is a um a grass viewer uh, which is uh, accessible for everybody uh, and um, more like for gaining information for learning purpose on uh, grassland ecosystem service supply and the learning about their uh, particular areas and, and it, their values from ecosystem service perspective and uh, then there is a bit more specific uh, tool, uh, Vivagrass Bioenergy, which is focusing on um, um, grassland potential for uh, energy production. And so it includes already a bit more sophisticated uh, calculations, but also it is freely accessible, uh, without, not requiring any special skills. And then there is more complicated part, uh, which is Vivagrass Planner, which is more for uh, professional users, planners, with uh, certain GIS skills. And uh, so this uh, uh, module yeah, requires some registration, so you cannot get uh, there in directly, but through applying, uh, you can get to anyone who, who would wish, uh, can get uh, access and, uh, and use this tool for, for planning purpose. And um, yeah, and then there are also, besides these uh, modules, certain data products like Vivagrass base map and, um, different uh, yeah, uh, information uh, ma management tools and uh, other da data products and uh, so but I will now give a little bit more information on, on this um, uh, three models 
I will not dive into methodology, how we were assessing ecosystem services and how the tool was constructed that would require another presentation, but all the information about it, it is available in our, in the Vivagrass uh, homepage, and we have also two papers published uh, explaining the way how, how the tool was developed, how ecosystem services was cal were calculated. But so now a bit more about these three models. So we work as um, viewers, so it is, yeah, even the information on ecosystem service supply has been calculated from farm field level, but it is also represented or aggregated on a national level. And uh, so, so here is a picture showing uh, the, uh, this ag aggregation on uh, three Baltic uh, uh, countries level and uh, so it is aggregating this data in a grid cell, so five to five kilometers grid, uh, yeah, grid cells. And, uh, and you can see here different yeah, this data sets, like here it is presented the percentage of permanent grasslands, uh, and, but it also shows uh, yeah, aggregated information on different ecosystem service bundles and trade-offs and also cold spots, cold Hotspots, this means the areas where are the higher or lower ecosystem service supply. And uh, here, if we zoom in, uh, then we get more to, yeah, so regional or farm, local farm level, up to farm level. And uh, so then we get the precise information on, on the different ecosystem service supply potential within the, each of the this uh, farmland fields. And uh, so there is possibility to, yeah, to choose between different ecosystem services included here. Um, so it's ma mainly provisioning and uh, regulating services, but for some parts also cultural services were assessed, but since the cultural services are more site specific, so this was not possible to do for all our country area. And uh, yeah, so beside uh, viewing how much different kind of ecosystem services are presented here, it's also, I don't know if I could get this way, I would show, I have difficulties to, to view the screen. So here on, on uh, this, okay, yeah. So it's also possible to, to check how ecosystem service supply would change in case of uh, changing the management practice. So it's by changing uh, with the turning of grassland to arable land or abandonment or other way around. So uh, by choosing uh, this change of land use, you can uh, see information how the ecosystem services uh, are they decreasing or increasing in this case. So that appears then with the arrows here for here show the different bundles, ecosystem services grouped in bundles and, and then their change. And uh, so besides this, we have also a recommendation for each particular field. Uh, so what would be the uh, most optimal uh, management practice to increase the ecosystem service supply? So by clicking on each of the field, you, you get this uh, recommendation. Okay, and uh, now going to next, uh, this biograss, um, <laughs> vivagrass bioenergy. Uh, so uh, here uh, it is, um, yeah, again, it is uh, data are presented uh, on field or field level or uh, actually any of uh, selected uh, area, you can uh, draw a polygon and get a calculation for the polygon what you have selected and you can get information on biomass potential in tons per hectare, also bioenergy potential in gigajoules per hectare and recommendation on uh, grazing pressure and uh, also district heating energy demand for the selected area and yeah, to use this uh, tool for planning, for, for example, if municipality is planning to uh, develop a heating facility which is based on grass biomass, uh, they can yeah, plan how much resources are available and where and how to collect them. So that's uh, bioenergy and then going to Vivogas Grass Planaria, which was uh, the most sophisticated part of the tool. 
So as I said, it requires certain uh, GIS skills to operate and uh, on, on this registration and access that you get your own profile where you actually can develop your own solutions and maps and prioritization of um, here is different based on different criteria. So it, it's built on this multi-criteria analysis uh, uh, method. Uh, and uh, so it offers a different um, from this attribute table, different criteria for prioritization. So it's based on different ecosystem services or other features which are included in the, in the tool. But since this um, um, model also allows uploading and downloading of data, you can also upload your own data sets and include your own criteria for particular prioritization purposes. And then you can add weights uh, to this uh, criteria, to this, say, for example, uh, for me, the most important is uh, um, some aesthetic uh, value or, or other way around some um, fodder production or, uh, or flood regulation. So, and to, to group uh, according, yeah, weight uh, this criteria based on your specific uh, purpose of, of the planning. and. So the dividing and this criteria, like a hundred percent dividing by all the criteria, uh, and uh, with that getting this um, calculation uh, algorithm for, for for your uh, planning purpose, and um, yeah, and so it can be applicable for very different uh, purposes and yeah, based on yeah sp specific user needs, and uh, here I will show few of applications of this uh, Vivagrass uh, planner. So we used it within the Vivagrass uh, project. We used in one of the case, the case study areas, this is municipality for uh, landscape uh, management planning. So uh, yeah, we used this um, multi-criteria analysis method to, uh, to prioritize areas from uh, yeah, landscape management uh, perspective. Uh, first assessing different on the selected uh, value criteria like aesthetic value, ecological, recreational, educational, cultural heritage value. Uh, and um, so is that getting um, yeah, rating of which it, uh, plot has a higher, which has a lower value and then adding uh, risks uh, uh, like risk of abandonment and uh, also distribution of invasive species. Uh, so like uh, this negative criteria and with that we got them uh, like a five actually six categories so first uh, two were uh, priority prioritized based on the so highest values and the highest risk so this, this means the areas which uh, demand certain action so it's very valuable but uh, it has high risk of abandonment or it's uh, affected by invasive species so there are certain men at active uh, interaction is needed. And the third uh, category was um, very high value, but low risk. So it means it's fine. It's very good. It's in a good state status, but it needs to be preserved. So it means to maintain the uh, properly to, to, main, to have this, uh, keep these values. And in such way we have uh, uh, using this um, planner, we have prioritized this um, um, sites for uh what you see in the map and but so this is pure mathematical process and it doesn't have this real knowledge about what is actually on the site and so we involved uh, stakeholders directly in planning so based on this uh, uh product uh, of uh, uh, of the tool the map we discussed this and actually we first screens this um, criteria and also weights what we have been adding and also during the meeting change some weights okay we see that this picture that does, doesn't really make sense so we a little bit move the weights from one to another we get a picture of what what we really see that it makes sense and uh, and then with, together with stakeholders uh, so they've divided in groups and they discuss different uh, scenarios strategies how to uh, improve this uh, landscape qualities in particular areas. So they define very also specific solutions where maybe some infrastructure, tourism infrastructure object um, yeah, uh, facilities should be established and uh, what, how to 
uh, highlight the values of, of landscape in each side. So from their local perspective, uh, adding this, their own local knowledge to, to this result, mathematical result of the tools that we developed a kind of a yeah, proposal for uh, improvement of uh, management of landscape qualities in this municipality. And these were uh, then summarized in the proposal for actually municipality development um, program action plan uh, how to, to yeah, work with landscapes in this area. So, okay. So now uh, moving yeah, to another application. So this was already not within Vivagrass project, but the tool was used by another project uh, in um, other area of Latvia, Lielpa River Basin, where we discussed some infrastructure, uh, green infrastructure development, particularly focusing on, on buffer zones about around, along the rivers. And so actually um, improving this flood control and also buffering of nutrients into uh, from agriculture fields into um, water courses. So looking at, at this grassland, uh, grasslands which have higher uh, potential of providing or higher demand. So uh, for where, where it's a highest priority to establish this buffer zone. So using this tool, again, we had a different um, criteria and also adding some other agroecological conditions in this prioritization model. Uh, so we, we developed a yeah, proposal how to improve the green infrastructure in the area. And yeah, these are two examples, but there have been uh, several more. And uh, also we hear from, from time to time from other countries interest to, to use it and, uh, okay. Oh. oh, sorry, I'm pressing too much. So we, we see that there is a tran transfer ability potential of this uh, good practice. And so, as I said, yeah, it has been used already in Latvia uh, and other Baltic countries for, for, in other projects like this Engreo project was for also interim project actually for green infrastructure planning. And then we uh, have now recently finished another interim project, Lancy Act, where we're, we're doing also ecosystem service uh, uh, mapping for assessing the um, trade-offs of uh, and interact land in context of land sea interactions and and uh, there we used for coastal parks this uh, this tool for assessing ecosystem services and uh, this tool is also used in, uh, in the learning process in university of latvia in the courses of landscape ecology and uh, natural capital so for demonstration uh, how actually ecosystem service um, mapping principles work and and then Estonia they used it actually in the national process of uh, ecosystem service uh, mapping and assessment by uh, um, yeah, using and or adjusting the, to, uh, the tools and modules of, of this Vivagrass tool to, 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 do, to do the national assessment and yeah so it has uh, yeah, different uh, applications so far, and it, it can be also so. In fact, it has been developed for the Baltic uh, states. So based on the, the, it works on assessments work on the basis of this base map, which was quite a work intensive process of uh, putting this data together. And uh, so they are uh, specific, yeah, for the three Baltic countries. But in principle, it can be applies this also by adding new data sets and using this uh, algorithms for uh, for for other countries and but, uh, yeah maybe the limitation is this uh, if we use the same ecosystem as service assessment matrix so it has been built on this data sets which we used and so it included some data for um, this uh, uh, which are uh, on a common actually for all EU countries on this, from this integrated administration and control system for payments uh, to uh, fa farmers. So where you report on your farm practice and, and get a, a payment. So, so this system is unified. So that part probably is uh, easy. Um, yeah. 
comparable and usable also in other countries, but then we also use specific soil maps, which actually is a specific classification, which was more uh, common in Eastern European countries, and it includes some uh, land quality assessment index, which we use in this calculation of ecosystem services. But I believe that also with other soil maps, it, since as I explained in this planner tool, it is possible to add new data sets and also actually it's possible to modify this assessment matrices. And so probably with some um, uh, creativity, it is uh, possible to use this, uh, the structure for, for calculation of ecosystem service values also in other areas. And then we have all supporting information available in our um, yeah, Vivagrass uh, homepage, which uh, has a se section on the tool that provides different in informative materials and um, manuals how, how this has been developed. And uh, so I guess it's yeah, possible to use also elsewhere. So thank you very much. Maybe you have some questions. Thank you very much. One, one, one. Thank you very much, Anda. Uh, we will get to questions um, uh, after the next presentation. Those who are in uh, Zoom, please don't hesitate to ask in the chat box and I will address the questions to the speakers. Those who are here in presence in Florence, uh, I will give you the word. You can write afterwards, you could raise the hand and then I will give you the microphone and you will introduce yourselves and then ask the question. But now I would like to give the floor to next speaker, to Markus Korhonen from Lapland University of Applied Sciences in Finland to present the virtual forest. So the floor is yours. Thank you. I hope you can see me. Should I share my screen or are you going to share the presentation from your place? You can share the screen yourself. Yeah, go ahead. OK, thank you. I hope you can see the presentation now. Yes, we can. Oh. You should put the full screen mode. Yeah, yeah, sorry, because the zoom bar is actually the way a little. Sorry. I will share the second screen. Okay, I, I hope you can see the presentation now. Yes. Okay, so thank you. My name is Markus Korhonen, and I'm here to tell you about Virtual Forest. And uh, Virtual Forest has been developed by Lapland University of Applied Sciences. Here in Finland, we are situated here in Rovaniemi in northern parts of Finland. So, Virtual Forest has basically been developed to enable the effective and user-friendly 3D visualization of forest and geographic data. Uh, our main idea in the development progress process has been to enable the possibility to, de to demonstrate and evaluate the effects of forest management in 3D. So basically what we have been doing is to transfer transform the um, forest and GIS data into a 3D visualization. And uh, why we have been doing this, we have thought it could be used to support different kind of decision-making processes in different use cases. For example, here in Northern Finland, forests are used by many different user groups. Uh, so the forest management operations affect different uh, activities that are happening in, in the forest. For example, the state-owned or other public, publicly owned forests are, are quite interesting to many parties. So, for example, here in northern parts of Finland, we have to take into account in forest management 
operations, for example, the forestry, uh, reindeer husbandry, tourism, and also other different kind of activities that are related to using forests. So for this kind of decision making processes, virtual forest could be quite useful. And we have actually used the virtual forest also in forestry education. Here is kind of the um, architecture picture of virtual forest. So we are, basically we are using the basic data for the virtual forest is the forest data and the GIS data. We, are, we can also use different kinds of data to increase the authenticity of the visualization. For example, to make the uh, visualization even more precise. And we can also use different kind of other data, which can make the visualization applicable to other use cases also. And uh, there is also a possibility to, for example, show the growth of the trees in in uh, different time spans. For example, here in Finland, it can be done by using the Simo simulation. And finally, uh, the Unity game engine is used for creating the actual 3D visualization of the forest. Um, as I mentioned before, the visualization is mostly based on geographic information and forest data. And um, we are using real ground models for, to enable the visualization of real ground elevation. And uh, ground vegetation is generated according to the forest type and the trees, they are generated according to the tree data. For example, in that background picture that you see here, all that ground vegetation, it's generated by the forest type according to the forest type and different for forest, different forest types the uh, lower vegetation is different. Uh, we can also add buildings and other man-made objects to the visualization. Also rocks, water bodies, roads, and other kinds of obstacles can be visualized. Uh, we can also move in the air or on the ground in the visualization. And one of the main uh, aspects in the application is that the uh, we can try and compare different kinds of forest management operations. So the user has the possibility to try different alternatives for the operation. And uh, the user can also change the operation as he likes, for example, to delineate the retention zones and other kind of retention treat groups and visualize, visualize those also in the 3D world. Um, here are some example use cases of the solution, what we have been thinking about. For example, it can be used in landscape planning, participatory planning. I think it could produce quite a lot of information for uh, managing different kind of uh, publicly owned forests, uh, for example, here in Finland. And, um, it can also be used in any kind of communication that uses or could use uh, visualization of different uh, uh, data in 3D format. And of course, there are some, some use cases in forestry also, for example, counseling of forest owners, forest planning, logging, and other kind of forest management. And not to mention, of course, the important aspect of climate change and all the other current topics that are related to forests and forests. Uh, here is kind of an example how the solution could be used. This is a, an imaginary example and the locking will not be executed as shown here, but to demonstrate the the, the use case for this kind of uh, application. Here is a locking of a stand next to a lake. So the landowner here, he wanted to have a, a retention zone around his tapping and also to take into account the scenarios 
uh, see, uh, sorry, the scenery is around the cabin. So he wanted to take also into account the other user groups that could be interested in the process. So here in this left bottom corner picture, here is the starting situation of the um, forested area and before the logging. And here is the map which shows the plan. So this area here, this dark green area, it is going to be left untouched. It's the retention zone next to the lake. And here is the cabin. And there are also some retention tree groups that will be left untouched. And this area is kind of the area that is going to be uh, handled by different kind of operations. And here are two examples with, of the operations that can be executed. Here is the, in the top left picture, you can, here is the view from the lake behind the, the, the retention zone that has been left next to the lake. And in this picture, you can see the scenery from the, in the air, from the bird perspective. And in this lower right-hand picture, there is another um, alternative for the operation, like it has been thinned. So basically some of the trees have been removed in this picture. So this is kind of a way to demonstrate the different forest management uh, alternatives to the interest groups and whoever is interested into, in participating in the process. And of course, also the landowner can get some information how the uh, actual operation will be executed. So now I'm going to change the screen share. I'll share the other screen, just a second. And uh, I hope you can see the map now. And uh, this is kind of the application we have built it on QGIS and it's, uh, this enables us to plan the operations. For example, here I have made the plan that you saw before. And uh, now, I'm going to jump into the actual. I'm sorry, we can only see the Zoom link. Um, the Let's say the browser of the Zoom meeting right now. OK, thank you for mentioning. Is it better now? Yes. OK, so here is the actual map. And uh, this is actually the same or almost the same plan that you saw before. And here. We have built a planning application on top of QGIS and it can be used for um, maintaining the data. And now I'm going to jump into the actual application. So here is the view from the lake. Sorry, I will move the bar so it's not in the picture. So here is the actual view from the lake. lake. And uh, those white squares that you see there, those are the cabins. And those are coming from the map. So that is kind of the way to demonstrate straight currently that we have a building there. And uh, I can move in the air. Then I can also walk on the ground. For example, now I'm, now I'm on top of water. And here you can see some, some, some of the trees have been removed. And I can also move to different kind of different places inside the area. We can visualize one in, a, in one go, 1.5 times 1.5 kilometers area. If I'll go here. Here is kind of a forest that has been untouched. And uh, here you can see some of the elevation. Those are coming from the National Land Survey of Finland data. So we are using uh, real data 
the visualization. And uh, we can also visualize some man-made objects here. And we have about 15 different tree species that can be visualized in the application. For example, here there is a power line going through the forest. And also behind the small hill, you can see the lake. And this could be a way to demonstrate the landscape effects in, for example, from this place using this kind of application. And uh, we also can visualize the roads here. As you can see here, here is a small sand road or gravel road. And it is possible to just walk through the roads and see the sceneries in the application. All those white squares again on the right hand of the right hand side of the screen are actual buildings that are there also, but they are visualized like that currently. But those can be uh, replaced by more accurate models if we model them. And the water bodies, they are also coming from the real geographic data. Um, yeah, I think that is most of the, this, this is kind of an introduction to virtual forest. So thank you. I believe I had 15 minutes about for this presentation. Thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, very interesting presentation and uh, it is uh, really great to see how the technology can help us and um, uh, and this uh, work is really impressive and um, uh, is I know Gonzalez in here so thank you very much uh, we might um, we might uh, skip to the next speaker and afterwards we will have the discussion for the whole, uh, all speakers. So uh, yeah, uh, I will give the word to Ainoa Gonzalez and uh, presenting the environmental sensitivity mapping web tool to support strategic environmental assessment and uh, plan making in Ireland. The floor is yours and we can see the screen so. Good morning, thank you very much. Um, can I share the slides myself or is somebody? Yeah, is you right? can share your okay. slides, yeah, of course. It might be just easier <laughs> for me to do. Everybody can see them, yeah? Yes, we can okay. see perfectly. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm sorry I'm not there in Florence with you. I believe it's raining, but I hope you're all having a good time with the opportunity to meet face to face. For uh, that probably makes a difference. Uh, I want to thank the, thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present on the environmental sensitivity mapping. Um, and before I suppose I start with the actual presentation, thanks also to all the people that are behind this tool. This, as you can see, many names on the slide, but just want to acknowledge the funding from the Irish Environmental Protection Agency, the Office of the Planning Regulator, and the Ordnance Survey, who provides the infrastructure, who's actually made this project publicly available. So there's a big team behind it, and there's a few number of years behind uh, the development of the tool, which is currently being used to support strategic environmental assessment and planning in Ireland. So to give you a bit of context, when we set to develop the tool, it was with the focus of supporting a strategic environmental assessment. I'm not sure how many of you know about SEA, but um, I'm sure you have heard the term and given that it's a European piece of legislation, I'm sure many of you have come across it, but basically entails examining the potential environmental effects of plan program implementation and entails the consideration of multiple environmental considerations, as you can see them listed there. So what with this tool, what we aim to do is to bring all those environmental considerations into a single platform to allow plan makers and the general public to have 
readily access to all those considerations to be able to scrutinize and, and to explore environmental issues at the national, regional and local levels. And in that way, try to kind of inform, provide the evidence basis, basis to inform decisions and to direct development to suitable locations. In centralizing everything and in making it publicly accessible to all, we're also pushing for transparency and accountability and decision making. So it's kind of in a way, it takes a lot of boxes in terms of compliance with European legislation, uh, ensuring transparency of plan making, providing a robust evidence base to, to inform plan, plan and land use zonings and, and fostering environmental protection by bringing awareness about environmental issues and then trying to direct development away from sensitive environmental areas. In doing that as well, even though it's a strategic, it then you know, you're anticipating issues at project level. So you're avoiding a lot of land use conflicts, public opposition and things like that at pro project development stage. The tool itself, um, I've seen that Marcus just uh, you know, gave us a demo, a live, well, live demo, recorded demo, and I'm, I'm sorry, given the time frame, I can't really do that. So it's all the screenshots, but I give you the access to the tool on the last slide and I encourage you all to explore, explore it uh, at your own time and contact me with any queries and comments, okay? But I'll explain you briefly what it's about. So it's got two main um, components. One is a data viewer. How many of you are familiar with data viewers these days? Digital mapping has become a um, common tool for many uh, sectors and areas. But what we've done in the viewer is centralize over 130 environmental and socioeconomic data sets relevant to environmental assessment and plan making. And we've organized them, as you can see here on the left hand side, according to European directives thematic requirements. And the, the tool has a novel, I suppose, approach to it by allowing people to scrutinize what each data set is about, because we thought as well, planners might not have full environmental awareness of certain things. So, for example, you must have you might have heard about um, what are ancient woodlands, what are Annex 1 habitats, but you not, don't necessarily know what those are. So we built specific targeted metadata for each of the layers to explain what that data is about, why is it important, and what is the legal context behind it. So this, in a way, serves also as an awareness raising tool, as an educational tool for planners. And we're actually finding out as well that it's really helping uh, third level education in terms of environmental planning and assessment. So we've been using it as, a, as an educational tool in other areas. Here you can see the breadth of data sets that are included. Um, one of the requirements for us was to make sure that the data sets were national. So we're providing consistency across administrative boundaries for planning purposes uh, and that they were obviously publicly available so we could access them and bring them together into, into this um, dedicated interface. And you can see again here how there is structure around SEA themes. The novelty of the tool or kind of the innovative part of the tool is what we call the environmental sensitivity mapping widget. This is the first one of its kind um, and it has gained a bit of international attention and, and we're very thankful also to the Interact for including it as, as a case study in your learning platform. We're very, uh, we're delighted with that. The widget itself, what allows you to do is produce bespoke sensitivity maps. And when I say bespoke is that they're context specific or planner specific. So what it does is allows you to Sorry, so I had screenshots here. The first thing allows you to do is select your study area. So you can run the analysis nationally, regionally, or locally. And then you select the environmental issues that are pertinent to that plan. Obviously, it's not the same to be considering a land use plan or a waste management plan or a renewable energy action plan. So the issues, the environmental criteria as both of concern will be different. So the widget allows you to select those on the basis of the issues at hand. And then here you might see a weight of one, and I'm really sorry, I have something interactive here that similarly is not working, but this weight varies from one to two. One means that 
the criteria are considered neutral. So if you bring in into the analysis biodiversity, landscape, water, etc., and you keep the weight of one, you give the same value, the same importance to all issues. If you change the weight to two, you obviously doubling up the importance of certain considerations. And the reason to include this weight was to comply, among other things, to comply with the Arrows Convention and the requirement of the, of the SCA Directive to allow for public participation. So this weight is a way to capture local concerns. So say you consult in a local community and say, we really must protect biodiversity, or we really have water quality issues in the region. This is a key priority. So then you can adjust the weight to capture those concerns and make those areas even more sensitive according to, to those perceptions. Very briefly, I mentioned that the methodology behind the widget is actually a very simple um, a multi criteria analysis. So it's a weighted uh, algorithm. It don't be put away by the formula, but all it does, it takes the layers that are overlapping in one location and adding them together on the basis of scores. And the scores have been defined through consultation. So we never said, you know, I don't know, uh, poor water quality has a score of three or a special protection area has a score of three. We, we undertook three iterative stakeholder workshops with representatives from the public and private sectors. And it was them, it was the, the experts that told us what the scores were. If you might be wondering why we had to set the scores is because you're mixing apples and pears really. So you have to say, bring water quality indicators or Q values with protection status of ecological designations, Natura 2000 sites uh, with flood risks. So you mix in legislative protection with actual quantitative indicators with landscape, for example, perceptions, much more subjective perceptions with risk when it comes to likes of flooding. So how you kind of harmonize those indicators? And this is the way we went about it, um, which again was um, developed, the approach was developed in consultation with multiple governmental uh, consultancy and local authority representatives. So when you run the widget, you produce this kind of maps and I'm just giving you an array of them just to make a couple of points. The fact that you can contextualize the maps to the plan or to the issues at hand is really important because every issue, every plan is different. And because as I said, you have to allow for public input into this sensitivity analysis. So if you look at the maps clockwise, the top one A is showing biodiversity considerations only. The B to the right is biodiversity and water. And the D and C are the biodiversity and water with different weightings, with different concerns or different double up of importance according to public opinion. So you're gonna have always, there's no one map that is standard. There's no one environmental sensitivity map for the country or for an area, because as I said, you have to contextualize it to the plan. So then you have to interpret these maps in the context of the criteria you brought into the analysis. You can see that many of the areas are captured in a similar way. So the red areas overlap um, when it comes, say, for example, to biodiversity. So there is a consist there's a very clear consistency because the data, special data is the data. Um, and one of the things we emphasize when we develop a deliver training on this and we build in the capacity of plan makers to use the tool is that these red areas are not necessarily logo areas. Some people kind of, you know, always the traffic like scheme um, kind of sets alarms in, in, in some people's heads. So we kind of emphasize that these red areas are areas where you might encounter most significant issues at project level. So you have to plan accordingly. But they're also areas that have a lot of, you know, the bulk of natural assets in the region. So they're provide ecosystem services. So they're valued areas that um, in terms of protection. Um, in any case, you know, whatever map you end up producing, we also developed a best book printout option that you can see here on the right hand side, where all the criteria and any weights you might have applied to the analysis are captured. So it's all very kind of accountable and transparent. And when you include this in a report and somebody wants to challenge or, or, or question or contest a given map, you can contact the producing author because we have a 
but you will also emphasize the need to take ownership and say who created that map. So anybody can question why such criteria weights were brought in. And indeed, an environmental NGO can just go and replicate that map and query what the sensitivities are, or they can produce an alternative map based on their own perception of things and submit it as part of a planning um, submission, for example. So there is, it kind of opens up a communication also in the planning process across multiple actors. It also allows comparability, transferability across regions, as well as data, as long as data is available. So um, in terms of, of the impact of the tool or what we've seen so far as well, one of the stakeholders call it a game changer. And I suppose the reasoning behind that is that it really has revolutionized the strategic environmental assessment processes in Ireland and, and plan making in a way, because now planners do not need to have GIS skills to access environmental data. Think that before the tool was uh, released, made publicly available, they had GIS technicians producing maps for them and giving them you know, hard copy maps, static maps. Now they can explore the information interactively. They can query, they can learn about the different areas. They can learn about environmental, different environmental issues and their legal context. So it's very much um, raised, I kind of brought a bit more of, of a center uh, stage in the environmental um, considerations throughout the plan making process. It also saves time and costs because people don't have to go now to different kind of web browsers looking for data, bringing it into their GIS desktop, processing data. I work in consultancy before coming to academia and it used to take me about a week to pull up a, a, a county map like this because you pull in data from different sources, managing it, uh, quality checking it, rasterizing it, et cetera, et cetera. So now you can do this in a couple of minutes. So by centralizing data, raising environmental awareness, breaking IT barriers, uh, and making information uh, transparent and accessible to all is really supporting um, cool landscape governance. Um, is also pushing for more participative processes because as I said, lay public, individuals, environmental NGOs, everybody has access to the same information now. Um, in terms of how it's been applied, we started in 2009, it was used to support the preparation of what well, assess some of the policies of the national planning framework. And following from that, the tender for the regional special and economic strategies in Ireland uh, required the use of the tool too. So it's been used in many, uh, in the preparation of many of such strategies, including that of the Eastern and, Eastern and Midlands region. And now it's currently being used to support the preparation of the review, um, I should say, of the county development plans. So it, it supports also that kind of tier process where information trickles from one planning stage to the other, ultimately informing projects. And it's, we've seen an application in other areas. Interestingly, we, I mentioned earlier, it was developed to support a strategic environmental assessment and planning, land use planning. But we've seen it also to uh, develop socioeconomic profiles for towns to look at. Uh, we have an interesting case study with quarry assessment. So different uh, active and inactive quarries and illegal quarries being assessed on the basis of the sensitivity around them to prioritize action on them. So it has spread to other sectors and other planning applications, which is really great to see. In terms yeah. of transferability, because it's based around the yeah, SEA. Because it's based around the SEA framework, it's transferable to other regions, um, given that there is local data for those regions. And just to mention, to finish up, just briefly mentioned that we're working on a spin-off projects to now apply it offshore to, uh, to support cumulative effects assessment and marine spatial planning. And we also finished currently a project that is another similar tool to support renewable energy strategies at the local level. So I'm sorry if I went beyond time. I don't have my clock here. Um, I'm very happy to take any questions. And thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Anna, for the presentation. And um, yeah, now starts the discussion time. So while the audience in Florence is preparing the questions, I will start with the questions which are in the chat box. So um, as uh, I know, uh, 
uh, your presentation was the last. I will start with the questions which are addressed to you. So uh, Ma Maurice Healy is asking, uh, has there been any interest from local authorities in the island as, the, as how they can apply the tool? And the second question from Maurice is, uh, are the data sets granular, granular enough to facilitate site-specific assessment or is it more suited for regional assessment? Yeah, yeah you can see also the questions in the yeah, chat box. Yeah, in there, yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's not that there has been an interest, Maurice, it's that they're currently using it. So government has used it already on the national planning framework. Regional assemblies have used it in the preparation of their strategies. And currently, local authorities are using it to support the preparation, the review of their county development plans. So we have multiple real life applications. And in fact, we currently compiling a story map of case studies that we're hoping to release in the next month or so. Um, in terms of the granularity of data, all the vector data that we have, even if it's national, some of it is very, is a, it's a kind of refined scale. So you can zoom in and get um, detailed information at land parcel level. But in terms of the sensitivity mapping, we stuck to a hundred meter square resolution just to be able to homogenize the various data sets and to provide something that was suitable at landscape level, um, but not be so specific at project level. So project developers won't take this as the solution because we believe at project level, you still obviously need field work assessments. So. Thank you very much for answering the question. Um, next, I will ask uh, another question to Marcus. Marcus, are you with us? So the question is from uh, Jordi Piedex, and uh, he writes, uh, as I understand that the tool virtual forest uh, allows the user to move at own will in the forest area. And secondly, is this today based on a hardware screen, but would it be applicable to full virtual reality? So, Marcus. Thank you for the question. Uh, yes. Yes, the user can choose where, the, where he wants to go in the virtual forest. He, has a, he can move by using the normal controls and he can move in the air or on the ground. And also to the second question, um, yes, it is possible to transform it into real uh, or full virtual reality. Uh, currently, we haven't done it, but we, are, we actually have another project going on in which we are testing it in another, another use case. Thank you very much, Marcus. Are there questions in the audience in Florence? If you have a question to any of the speakers, please raise the hands. Yeah, we have a question. I will pass the microphone. So please introduce uh, yourself and then ask the question. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ita Jemberi from Hungary. We are working on a national level ecosystem service assessment and uh, the web tool, the Vivegrass web tool is very impressive <laughs> and we are kind of thinking producing such a, a system. My question is uh, how detailed the, the basic data are for grasslands because our biggest issue is to gather the scientific uh, data on evaluating the condition of uh, grasslands and based on that it's not to so if you don't have precise condition data and management data it's not easy to build the assessment of the ecosystem services so this is the question how detailed and where you can have the, the details from. So you have the local data only on the pilot areas or you have a kind of national uh, grassland assessment. Thank you. Yeah, so Anda is joining the panel and she will answer the question shortly. Thank you very much for this question. Um, yeah, uh, it's uh, 
actually, yeah, very important is this um, uh, data quality or accuracy. Uh, as we were doing it on them, basically we, we were trying to compile, to produce a system which is uh, uh, applicable on whole national level. So we were working with, uh, the, uh, not only with the pilot areas, and pilot areas we were more testing uh, different solutions and, uh, and, um, and the usability of this uh, tool applicability. But uh, so uh, in principle, we were uh, building our assessment on data sets which, which are uh, uh, ready available across the whole country. And so th these were actually three uh, major data sets, which were this, um, uh, what is it, this for, um, for farmland payment systems, this uh, de declaration system, which uh, uh, people declare what kind of, uh, uh, it includes also what kind of, if it is protected semi-natural grassland habitat, it includes this information based on latest uh, available surveys and, and what is the management practice applied. So this is a standardized data available for, um, for or nationally, of course, only for those farmlands which are participating in this payment system, but they cover most of the country. And uh, so th this is, in principle, a data set which is uh, um, uh, uh, updated every year, and so it uh, reflects the situation. But of course, it doesn't have spe very specific information on um, quality of, uh, of uh, each farmland plot. So, it, yeah. And so, our in our um, assessment uh, pro, uh, algorithm, it was uh, it was built more on a what is it a simple uh, yeah, classification, if it is a arable land, is it a, um, per, uh, a permanent uh, grassland, or it is a, a semi-natural, yeah, biologically valuable grassland. So three uh, categories. And then additional to that, there was a soil um, quality maps which in our case are not very, at the moment right now, there's ongoing projects or actualization of the soil information. So, but the data which we used were quite, I would say old from uh, starting from 60s so of the last century. So, so there, there is no work on actualization. And, and, and as I was this um, uh, relief digital model, because, for part of ecosystem services, uh, relief also plays important role. So these were three data sets based on which we had developed the assessment matrices of uh, uh, assessing ecosystem services. So if we put uh, together the three data sets for, um, for all the country. So uh, but based on this, it's not very uh, site-specific information. Um, it, uh, but yeah, it can be all the time uh, updated, changed, replaced to newer data. And uh, it, uh, our the concept of the tool actually yeah, uh, allows also integration of additional data sets and additional criteria. So the, the current matrix of assessment of ecosystem services is on the three data sets, but I think it, uh, uh, it's not limited to, to that. And if we get um, quality, uh, ac actual quality data, on the, uh, yeah, actual status, it, it can be integrated and probably it should be uh, added to this assessment matrix with putting some, yeah, adjusting the score. Or, yeah. Thank you very much, Anda. Is there uh, any more questions from the audience here in Florence? Okay, no, I don't see the hands. Uh, Marcus is uh, adding, so I will inform also the audience in here that uh, virtual forest is now based on a hardware screen. It is possible to transform into full virtual reality. 
So, okay, if there is no more questions, then uh, I will close this uh, panel uh, number one, which is called the analysis. And uh, the good practices, majority of the good practices presented today will be published in the handbook number four. Uh, there are three handbooks already presented uh, in the Interreg Europe uh, Progress uh, homepage, uh, webpage. So you are welcome to engage, uh, get more information about these good practices and get the best use out of them for yourselves or for any relevant stakeholders. And uh, yes, so before I give the floor to the uh, moderator of the second panel, uh, there will be another short video uh, of the good practice of uh, our project. So enjoy and thank you for being uh, with me on this first panel. Yeah. Forests are strongly related to the water cycle. Dense forests decrease water flow. Heavily managed forests generate water quality decline. Sustainably managed forests provide a healthy balance. This ecosystem service is well known within the scientific community, but not formally recognized in legislation. It is not considered in landscape, water or planning policies, or even acknowledged by key sectoral actors. Forest for Water in Catalonia provides a first step towards recognition of this important ecosystem service by assembling a diverse group of key stakeholders in the region. Stakeholders include a water reservoir consortium, local municipalities, forest owners and regional union, a water administration, the Office for Climate Change, urban master plan managers, the Regional Ministry of Agriculture and Forests, province administration and forest research centres. Together, they enhanced regional governance for water and achieved official recognition of forestry in the urban master plan as a key economic activity because it ensures the provision of good quality water, an important ecosystem service. Once recognized, a real payment for ecosystem services mechanism has also been designed and implementation has commenced. The fund focuses on the enhancement of blue water provision and risk reduction for forest fires. In the midterm, it is expected to triple the amount of forest land being managed annually in the area, prioritizing fire prevention and restoration, and regulating tree density to achieve a potential 8 to 10% increase in water release to the water reservoir, while ensuring biodiversity conservation. The local Forest for Water Fund will engage water agencies, rural tourism, and other local businesses. The newly created Association of Forest Owners will be responsible for implementation of the actions envisaged in the plan. Thanks to projects like Sincere and Progress, this experience could be replicated all over Europe. Visit the Interreg Europe Progress website to learn more about our project activities. <laughs>